Hi, I'm Catherine from the Sewing Studio Fabric Superstore and the Sewing Studio at Lady Lake. I cannot wait to help teach you everything you need to know today about your brand new Baby Lock Soprano. Okay, let's get started. Okay, I'd like to go over some of the wonderful features of this Baby Lock Soprano and why it is that you would buy this machine in particular. So first of all, this machine comes equipped with an LCD screen. It's awesome. It lets you see not only what stitch you've chosen, but what foot you need and a whole slew of other editing options for within your stitches. This machine is only 21 pounds, which makes it extremely versatile to take with you to groups and clubs or to visit a friend or just to have at home. Because it's 21 pounds, it's a good mid level machine. There are built-in stitch memory for this machine available to you. So if you want to customize your settings, you are able to do that right there within the machine. There's an advanced pivoting function right here on the side of the machine. This allows you to lift your presser foot while you're sewing to keep your hands on your project. And I'll go over that in more detail. This machine comes with an automatic fabric sensor system, which is basically automatic tension. So you you don't have to fuss around with what tension should I use? How should I set it? The machine's automatically going to do that for you. There is an advanced needle threader on this end of the machine, which means you don't have to thread it. The machine's gonna do it, which is so awesome. There are 300 built-in stitches. And as a matter of fact, right in the lid of the machine, these 300 stitches are available for you to be able to see at a glance. You don't have to dig out your manual because they're right here on the lid of your machine. And there are 16 included feet, which is amazing. All right, let's get into the meat of the instruction. So there are 16 included accessory feet with this machine and a whole slew of other things that are gonna help you with your sewing journey. So when you open your box, all of this is going to be in there for you. So let's go over everything. So first of all, you've got a soft cover to keep dust off of your machine. You've got a little accessory tray for your seven primary feet that are your main utility sewing feet. As far as your utility sewing feet are concerned, you've got your automatic button holder, you've got your J foot on the machine, which is your standard utility presser foot, you've got your N foot, which is a decorative foot for monogramming and decorative stitches, your G foot for overcasting, your R foot, which is your blind hem foot, you have your I foot, which is your zipper foot, you have your M foot, which is a button fitting foot. So you put a button in there and you can sew a button on. You of course have a seam ripper because we all need one of those. You'll have four bobbins in your box. One of them is going to be installed on the machine. You've got your power cord, of course, thankfully, and we've got your presser foot for your foot pedal. Um, you've also got as some accessory bonus feet that are coming with the machine, a quarter inch foot with a guide, you have a stitch guide foot, you have an open toe free motion quilting foot. So that one's got that easy viewing area for you. You also have your center needle free motion foot, which has got a nice tight control over your free motion area. You have an echo quilting foot, you have a blind hem or piping foot, which is also an adjustable zipper foot. You've got your walking foot, which is fantastic for managing multiple layers of fabric. If you'd use twin needle sewing, you'll need your auxiliary spool pin. There are three main spool caps that come with this machine, your small, medium, and large, and actually you get two medium spool caps. There's also an additional little mini spool, which is wonderful for certain types of spools of thread that don't have an end cap on them already. Okay, you also have a Teflon foot, which is extremely good for um, vinyls and other fabrics that might be slightly harder to manage. You have an open toe candle wicking foot. You have a quilt guide bar, which helps you set up your stitches so that you can do channel quilting, or it just helps you guide your stitches in the proper placement. You have an, a variety pack of needles, as well as a twin needle set. 
You have several different types of screwdrivers. You have two different bobbin covers. One comes installed on the machine and that's your quarter inch with a guide. And then you have a blank bobbin cover as well. You have your awl, which helps poke holes in your eyelets if you sew an eyelet. It's also got a hole in the top of it, which allows you to um, feed ribbon through if you need to, to, so that you can pull it out on the other side. And everybody needs a cleaning brush. Last but not least, you have a little bit of a thread net for those metallic threads and harder to use fussier threads. This helps manage those threads. And most of those accessories come in this pouch or in that little accessory foot tray. Your Baby Lock Soprano has an extra little box within your larger box. That box contains this, which is your awesome extension table. This is wonderful for when you have bulkier, heavier projects like quilts or circle skirts or whatever you need that needs a little bit extra lift so it doesn't drag against your fabric. When you turn your extension table over, on the inside there, you've got, first of all, your knee lift is tucked away in there so that it doesn't get lost, and then you have legs for your extension table. So in order to put your table in place, you're simply going to take your legs and toggle them down so that they can stand up on their own. All right, let's get this installed onto our machine. All right, so we're gonna start by taking off our accessory tray. So here's our accessory tray. Underneath the end of it, there's a little space where you can just put your fingers underneath of it and simply pull. That's going to remove your accessory bin, your accessory tray. Then you've got your extension table, which you're going to simply place by your machine. And the opening of your extension table goes right here on the neck of your machine. So you're going to just gently slide it into place. And it clicks on just like that. Now, if you have an uneven table or your surface isn't even, with these little legs that you've got here, these little caps spin up and down so that you can better balance your machine's accessory tray, and it just gives you a nice flat level surface area. To remove this extension table, you're gonna to need to give a good tug because once it's clicked in, it's clicked in pretty good. So you're gonna take one hand on your table, one hand in your machine if you need to, and you're simply going to pull and that will remove your extension table. At that point, you have access to your free arm if you need it for a pant leg or a sleeve or any other round objects, or you can reinstall your accessory tray. So the accessory tray simply slides back into place. Right here on the front of the machine, you have your port where you're gonna install your knee lift if you choose to use it. So your knee lift, the end of it has like little wings off of it. So those are going to go up and down just like the little installation port has. So you're simply going to install your knee lift. Once you've pushed that in, you can now move your knee lift up and down by pushing it to the right and to the left and it will raise and lower your presser foot. One of the awesome features that the Baby Lock Soprano comes with is the ability to raise and lower your feed dogs. So if you're doing free motion quilting, you're going to wanna to take this switch that's here on the back of the machine and you're going to toggle that switch towards your machine, towards this side. That you can see there's a little picture right here at the bottom of it where the teeth are below the line. And when you're sewing, you're gonna bring that switch back to the right side and that's where your feed dogs are actively rising, pulling your fabric back and dropping down underneath. So for free motion, you're gonna be on this side of it. For regular sewing, you're gonna be on this side of it. Let's just take one second to talk about this wonderful little tray, accessory tray for your feet. So back in the day, these feet would fly everywhere, but now they've manufactured these so that your feet do not fall out. So what does that mean? Well, if you take a close look at your accessory tray, each of your feet are held in by little clips like this, which means when you need to remove one of the feet from this tray, you actually have to put pressure against the tray while you're lifting the foot out. It takes a little bit of a pull to get it out of there, but that's good because they don't go flying. To set your machine up for sewing, we need to begin by installing the thread. Usually we start with winding a bobbin. So as you look at the bobbin, your bobbin has a little groove on one little side of your bobbin, right towards that, off of that center pin area. 
However, this does not matter all that much in terms of the fact that Baby Lock makes it super si simple in that you just push your bobbin down into place. Once you've pushed your bobbin down into place, you'll turn your bobbin clockwise until you hear a click. That little wire is going to land into that groove and now it's going to hold that bobbin nice and snug against the bobbin winder. Okay, as far as thread is concerned, they recommend that your thread comes off the bottom of the spool. Some spools have to come off the top just by the way that they're wound. The most important thing is, no matter what you do, if you have an old school style of spool with a slit cut in one end, that slit has to be on this right side so that as the thread passes towards the left, it doesn't get caught on that little slit in your plastic. So I'm going to raise my spool spool pin and install my thread right down onto my spindle. All right, so now that I'm there, I'm going to match as closely as I can the spool cap to the size spool that I'm using. So your spool cap is going to install and it's going to hold your spool nice and stuck against the back there. Now that I have my thread on my spindle, I need to go ahead and start the process here. So one is one for both threading the machine as well as doing the bobbin. I know this because one's got a dotted line and a solid line beside it. Your dotted line is what's used as the path to follow for winding your bobbin. The solid line is the line that's used for threading your machine. So we're gonna pass behind the number one port. Down here at the bottom, you've got a little metal hook right there. So it needs to pass underneath of that hook. Once you've got it underneath that hook, we're gonna come right here to number two. At number two, in order to install the bobbin, we need to go ahead and go towards the right where our bobbin area is. So I'm gonna pass over here towards the right. There is kind of like an L made out of this part of the metal bracket, and right in the center of that L is the little tension disc for the bobbin. So we're gonna start at the back of this and come straight down between this bar and this disc, and then we're gonna head over to the right. So it's kind of like we're gonna write the letter L. So I'm going to take my thread, and I'm going to start at the back of that. I'm going to pass straight down in between the bracket and the disc, and then I'm going to pull my thread to the right. Now that's going to snug the thread in nice and tight under this disc from about nine o'clock to six o'clock if I'm looking at a clock. I'm going to take my thread and give it a nice tug over here towards my bobbin. Once I'm here at my bobbin, there's a little indicator picture here that tells you what to do. So I'm going to pull my bobbin towards the right, and I like to wrap it around six or seven times because we don't have to hold it through that silly little hole anymore. So once I have it wrapped around six or seven times, let's just take a quick look right there. There's a little slit cut into the bobbin holder right there because there's a razor blade under there that lets me take my thread, pass it into that slit, and then if I pull my thread to the right, it's going to cut off my excess thread. Once I've got that, I can use my start stop button if I don't have my foot pedal plugged in, or I can step on the gas of my foot pedal. I love to use my start stop button. So I'm simply going to press start and it starts winding the bobbin. When I'm satisfied with the amount of bobbin I have wound, I can simply press stop. That stop is going to stop it from winding. Now you need to disengage the bobbin towards the left, so I'm pushing it back towards the left, and then lift your bobbin off. Now, there's a razor blade right there, so instead of reaching for your scissors, you can use that razor blade to simply cut your bobbin off of the machine and bobbin winder right there. In order to install your bobbin, we're gonna begin by taking this little rectangle. It's a spring-loaded bobbin cover. So we're gonna pull that rectangle to the right and it pops open that bobbin cover. Now, when we take our bobbin, it's just a drop-in bobbin, which is awesome. So the thread needs to be coming off the left-hand side of the bobbin, kind of like a P for perfect. You're gonna simply drop your bobbin right down into your machine. Okay, so there's a little picture right here that shows that the thread is coming off 
so it's counterclockwise. When we pull the thread to the right, the thread is coming off the left side and that bobbin is turning counterclockwise from within your machine. All right, now we're gonna swing under this little arm right here. However, that's right where your tension disc is. So it really is best if you hold that bobbin down with one of your fingers so that it can't move. And then with a good amount of tight pull, you're gonna swing your bobbin thread from five o'clock on the clock past six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, and nine o'clock. Once you're there, you can let go because we're simply gonna go around the top of this little mountain right here, groove for your thread. All right, as I hit right there, there's actually a razor right there that cuts off your excess thread, which is awesome. Then you're going to take your bobbin cover and reinstall it. There's a little tab in the bottom left-hand corner of your bobbin cover, which actually goes into that little metal tab port on the left side of your bobbin area. So we're gonna install that and simply push down your bobbin lid and it clicks right back into place. Before I thread the machine, I need to make sure my needle is installed properly. Most needles are gonna have a round side and a flat side. The flat is on the back, and that is installed towards the back of your machine. Now, this is the screw that you tighten and loosen in order to install that needle. Once you have the needle in, I wanna take a second right here and look at this area. This is very, very important. There's a little round dot there, that is the stopping point for the needle. You can actually see right there, that is the needle touching that dot. If there is a gap there or darkness, that means that your needle isn't fully installed all the way up into your machine. So make sure when you install the needle with the flat side on the back that it's all the way up in the machine touching that dot. Let's take a moment to discuss these markings here on your needle plate. At the back of the machine, you've got markings in inches. These markings and these distances are based off of a left needle position. So the typical garment seam allowance is 5 eighths of an inch. That 5 eighths line right here is going to be based off of your left needle position. Towards the front of that, you've got your measurements in metric. Along the very front of your bobbin case area, you do have two bobbin covers. This is the quarter inch with a guide um, bobbin cover marking. This is based off of a center needle position. You would place the edge of your fabric here to get that perfect quarter of an inch. There's also some other helpful measurements here across the front of the bobbin case. So make sure you reference your manual for those. Before you thread your machine, there's one thing you need to do that's very important. Right over here is the area where if your foot is down, there is a little door that's going to close. So I'm gonna put my foot down and you can see that that door is closed. I need to make sure that if I'm going to be passing thread through here, that door is open so the thread can come into play. This is very important, not only for that door area, but also right here, right as soon as you begin threading your machine, this is where there's also a tension disc hidden underneath this little plastic wall. So we need to make sure our foot is up right before we even begin threading. Okay, let me thread the machine. So I'm gonna start by passing around this little hook right here at number one. I'm going to go underneath the little metal here on the front of the machine and go up. So there's a little U-turn that happens right there. Once I'm there, I need to pass around towards the left. I like to hold onto my thread with my right hand so that I've got some tension on it as I pass through the tension areas on the machine. So I'm going to swing the thread around the back there at number two and then come straight down. This channel comes down to number three. There's a little U-turn area here at number three. So I'm gonna start on the right and move towards the left, and I'm gonna come up the channel. So as I pass up that channel, you'll see here on the top of the machine at number four, the thread starts on the right and swings around towards the left. So make sure you come up on the right, swing around at the back, and then come down on the left. As we come down, we're gonna pass by number five right here. Okay, so let's look real quick right here at number six. We need to pass the thread in between this little needle bar and the little clamp that sits on top of it. It's easiest to do with this with some tension on your thread. So I like to take my thread with both of my hands and I'm going to pass that thread up over that needle bar 
and in between there. It's kind of like flossing your teeth. And then gently pull your excess thread just down and straight. Now we're going to pass up in between this on our way up over to number seven. So I'm gonna pass the thread up over number seven. Here on the side of the machine, we are going to have a cutter right there. So we're gonna take our excess thread and cut that excess thread on number eight. Okay, this is the most exciting part of it. This right here is the little area number nine where we can actually use the machine to thread our needle for us. So simply with a little bit of extra pressure, push that down and our needle is threaded. Okay, let's review the buttons that are on the face of your machine starting from the left and going towards the right. So first and foremost, here we have our start stop button. If you do not have your foot pedal plugged in, you can start sewing and stop sewing with this button. So this button is red right now because the presser foot is up. If I put the presser foot down, it's green, which is indicating that it's ready to go to start sewing. This also turns orange if our bobbin winder is engaged. So red for stop, green for go, orange for bobbin winding. Okay, the next button we have here is our reverse button. If you're sewing and you wanna go backwards a stitch or several, this is going to be where we're gonna hold down our reverse button. If you tap it, it will take one stitch in reverse. This is our reinforcement button or our locking button. This button is the one that we tap when we want to choose a stitch that locks in place as opposed to progressing forwards and progressing backwards. And we're gonna go over that in just a minute. This also has a little green light on the left hand end of this button. This button allows you to finish a motif while you're in the middle of sewing it. Instead of cutting it off right wherever you stop, if you hold this button down, that little light is going to turn green and it will allow you to finish the motif. And again, I'll go over that in more detail later on in the lesson. This button right here is your needle up, needle down button. So wherever your ne needle is currently residing, like right now my needle is in the up position, if I touch this button, it will go down. If I touch it again, it will come back up. This is our scissor button. If we wanna cut our threads, we can use this scissor button to cut our threads. Or you can pull your fabric out from the back and use your thread cutter on the side. This is our presser foot lifter button. If I want to put my foot down, I can touch that button or I can touch it again to lift it up. You can also actually raise and lower your presser foot from a lever here on the back of the machine. Okay, so if I have the presser foot in the down position, I can raise it by pushing this lever backwards. If I wanna lower it manually, I can bring it down so that it's down and the foot is down. However, I do wanna point out one thing. If I have used the machine to grab a hold of that foot and lift it up for me, I no longer have control over my presser foot lever button because I put the machine in control. So if I want this to be active for me to use, I need to put the foot down. Once the foot is down, I now have control of this again where I can raise and lower my foot at my will. Right here you have your speed control. This actually does three different things for you. When I do not have the foot pedal plugged in, this is my speed and it is a sliding scale. It's not just slow or medium or fast. It goes from slow all the way up to fast as I move it along and you can do that while you're sewing. If you do have the foot pedal plugged in, this actually acts kind of like a jockey holding the reins on your foot. So usually I have my speed on medium with my foot pedal plugged in because this is going to prevent my right foot from going off to the races. It holds it back for me. Okay, there are several different ways that you can select your stitches. First of all, on the left hand side of your screen here, this is kind of like our stitch pockets area. So if I want to start by selecting my keyboard way of selection, notice that it's almost like an old school phone that right there I've got my little display of stitches. Those are these 10 most commonly used stitches. So if I just wanna quickly select a zigzag stitch,
just by touching number five. As long as I'm in my keypad way of sewing, I've just done that. And right here on the screen, it shows me I'm in my keypad way of selection and I've chosen stitch number five. All right, moving down into our utility stitches, if I select my utility button, that little light now jumps down to my utility selection. Over here on the lid, this is where we've got our stitches displayed in a nice easy access. So if I want to access any of these utility stitches, I begin by selecting the utility key first and then typing in the stitch. So I'm going to start by selecting that utility key, which I'm doing right there. So I've selected my utility key, and then I can say to myself, okay, I wanna do overcasting, which is stitch number 16. So I'm going to go back to my keyboard and type in one six. So the display here shows me I'm in my utility key and I've chosen stitch number 16. All right, if I wanna access one of these beautiful decorative stitches, there's this kind of leaf vine, and if I touch it one time, that's gonna give me access to all of these. So down here on the face of your machine, you've got your little vine there, so select that. It asks me, first of all, hey, wait a second, you wanna get off of number 16? Yeah, I do, so I'm gonna actually select okay. So there we are on our vine, and it's vine one, which shows me right there on the screen. So up here, if I wanted to do this beautiful stitch, stitch number 34, I'm simply going to type in 34. There we have that beautiful stitch, vine one, stitch number 34. What if I want to do one of these, like this little cute little dense satin stitch right here? It is number 10 in vine two. So if I come over here to the left side of my screen, there is no vine too, but yes, there is. If I touch it a second time, it now engages that pocket of stitches. So I'm in vine two. And again, in order to do number 10, I'm simply going to type in number 10. And there I'm at number 10. Uh-oh, notice that it built number 10 off of number 34 from the previous selection. So down here at the bottom of my screen, I've got a C around this kind of U-turn button. This is a clear button. So I can delete all of those and then type in number 10. And now I'm ready to go with number 10 as opposed to number 34 and number 10. And I'll go into that in more detail later as well. Up here on the screen, we on our lid, we also have a third selection of stitches. This is so vine number three. These are actually a combination of stitches out of all of these other pockets. So if I want to access one of these stitches, I would simply go to the vine and touch it a third time. So there I am on vine three, and I need to touch clear to clear off number 10 from vine two. And now I can go up here to number 22 and select 22 on my screen. Vine three, stitch number 22. The Baby Lux Soprano comes equipped with all sorts of lettering fonts as well. These are small fonts that are going to be about the size of my finger. And there is a block font, an italicized font, an open font, which is really good with high contrast threads. So white thread on black fabric, black thread on white fabric. You've got a Greek font and a an, uh, foreign font. So you can go to your manual and reference how to select a specific letter to spell out whatever you need to. Okay, so I'm gonna begin by sewing a left needle position straight stitch. So I'm in my keypad way of selection, which means I'm using these 10 most commonly used stitches, and I selected stitch number one, so it shows me right there I'm on stitch number one. Now, first and foremost, it shows me that I need to have my J foot on the machine. See the little letter J right there? And that's actually the foot I have on the machine. Down here, you can see that there is black backgrounds around white numbers. The black backgrounds are default settings. So if I wanted to make a change to those, I can make that change because I'm in control, but now my setting is on a white background with black numbers. So again, your black backgrounds are your home base or your default settings. So I'm gonna leave this alone for now and let's just start sewing a straight stitch. So I'm gonna place my fabric underneath my foot 
and I'm going to use the button to put my foot down and I'm going to start sewing. This particular stitch I'm going to do entirely manually, which means I need to do all the work all on my own. So I'm going to start sewing a few stitches. Once I've taken those stitches, I need to hold down my reverse button. So I'm going to hold down the reverse button and when I let go, it stops reversing. If I need one more reverse stitch, I simply tap my reverse button and it took that one more stitch. So now I'm gonna keep on sewing towards the front of my piece. When I get to the end of where I want to sew, stop sewing, take my foot off the pedal. I'm going to hold down my reverse button for a few stitches. That was four. Now I'm going to start sewing again. Okay, I'm taking my foot off the gas. Now I'm going to use my cut button. And then I'm going to use my presser foot lifter button to raise my presser foot. So I've just formed this stitch entirely on my, my own without any of the features of the machine. So let's just see what that looks like. You can see at the beginning and end of the stitch, I have my reverse stitches. So now I'm going to start to let the machine work for me a little bit. These functions here on the side are wonderful, wonderfully helpful, and they accomplish the work for you so you don't have to do it all. So this first button right here is an automatic reverse button. So if I select that button, it's going to turn on an automatic reverse for me so that when I start sewing, it will do my few reverse stitches for me right there at the beginning of my stitch. So let's see what that looks like. So I'm over here at my machine and when I press on my foot pedal, the machine takes a few stitches forward and then it automatically goes back for me so I don't have to hold down my reverse button. Now, once I get to the end, I'm going to stop sewing, simply lift my foot off the pedal and I'm going to tap my reverse button. When I do that, the machine is now taking three or four stitches backwards for me and stopping with the needle in the down position. So now I simply touch my cut button and then I'm going to touch my presser foot lifter button. And there's that. So now the machine did the reversing for me. All right, so that was the automatic reverse. Now, if I deselect that and I touch my scissors, you'll notice that both of these turn on blue. So again, when I only select my auto reverse, just my auto reverse comes on. But when I select my auto cut, my reverse function comes on with it. So this is actually going to do even more for me than just reversing. It will also cut for me when it's done sewing. So let's see what that looks like. Again, when I step on my foot pedal, it's gonna take a couple of stitches forward, a few of them backwards, exactly, it knows what to do. When I get to the end, I'm going to take my foot off the foot pedal. The needle stops in the down position. So I'm going to tap my reverse button. It automatically reverses, comes back forward, and it actually cut for me as well. So now all I have to do is touch my presser foot lifter button. And when I do that, my foot comes up and it's already cut underneath. Let's take a second to look at those beautiful little tails. The final option here on the side is the automatic lift and pivot function. I love this. So when I select this, it's actually going to raise the presser foot for me at the end of the seam as well. So it's going to practically do all the work. So once I start sewing, the machine's going to sew forward, automatically do my reversing, and come forward. When I get to the end, I'm going to raise my presser foot when I raise my foot off the foot pedal, the presser foot itself automatically lifted. So if I tap my reverse button, it's going to automatically reverse for me, come back forward, pull it down, cut it, and lift my foot. So it just helps you move incredibly efficiently through the world. So it did the automatic reverse at the start. When I got to the end, I told it I'm done, so it did the automatic reversing. It pulled the threads down underneath, cut those little tails for me, and then lifted my presser foot. Whoosh, I was in and done. 
I want to talk a little bit more detail about this lift and pivot function. So what it's actually doing is marrying the raising and lowering of this foot to pressing on or taking off pressure on your foot pedal. So the idea is that instead of fighting the curve and forcing your fabric under the pedal like we used to do, that the foot is lifted so that you can maintain contact on your project and simply spin your fabric into position. So if I needed to sew on that line right there, I'm going to go ahead and start sewing by putting my pressure on my foot pedal. Once I get to a point where, oop, I need to curve my fabric, so I can simply push my fabric and now step on the foot pedal again. I'm at another point where I need to curve so I can move my fabric and push on the foot pedal again. That's a steep curve, so I could only do a couple of stitches so I can manipulate my fabric this way without fighting my feed dogs, which is how we used to always work, is forcing it under there and pulling and twisting. Then you're putting all kinds of stress on your needle. By using your lift and pivot function, you're able to just gently let the feed dogs work for you and let the machine work for you so that you're not busy fighting it. So that's a better example there of how that lift and pivot function works is that it allows you to follow a curve by not forcing your fabric underneath your foot or fighting your feed dogs. It lets you work more efficiently and properly throughout your curves. Okay, so I want to spend a moment just talking about the difference between reversing and reinforcing or locking. So right now on my fabric, I have chosen a stitch and performed it with a reverse. That's got a good, nice, secure beginning and entry um, and exit point for my stitches. So if I had a garment or an area where I had stress against my stitches or against my fabric pulling from one side to the other, the reverse stitching is good for garments, for curves, for tote bags, for inside seams and things like that. But quilters don't necessarily want all this buildup of stitches on their fabric. It creates bulk. So there's also a reinforcement stitch. So if we look here at stitch one, two, three, and four, they are all straight stitches. So what's the difference? difference between all of those? Well, if I look at one and two, on the left side of the oval, there's a little dot. That little dot shows me that I'm in the left needle position. On number two, that little dot is in the left side of the oval as well. On number three, the little dot is in the center of the oval because number three is a straight stitch in the center needle position. Number four is also in the center needle position. So still, what's the difference between left needle, left needle, center needle, center needle? Well, if you look at the start of the stitch at number one, there's a little dash at the start. That indicates that this stitch has a reverse where number two has a dot at the start of the stitches. Number two is a reinforcement stitch or a locking stitch. So I'm going to select that and let's just take a second to see what that looks like. So I've selected stitch number two. It shows me that right on my screen and I still need my J foot on. All right, let's sew that and see what happens. So the needle actually stitches in place for this one instead of going forward and backward, so I'm done sewing, this time, instead of tapping my reverse button, I'm going to tap my reinforce button or my locking button. When I tap that one, now this time, it just stitches in place. So this way, I don't have all the bulk and buildup of the reverse stitching. So I'd like to talk about some of these settings that are here on the bottom of the screen. The first one that we come to is a W, and that stands for width. So this is our width adjustment, but we're on a straight stitch, so what does that do? Actually, this moves the needle position. So as I toggle towards the right, my needle actually moves to the right. And as I toggle to the left, my needle moves to the left. The center editing option is your stitch length, and you can see that indicated by a dot, a small dash, and a long dash. So if I want a slightly longer stitch, let's say I'm basting, I'm going to simply add to my 
stitch length to take it up to say a four or even possibly a five. If I wanted a shorter stitch for paper piecing, I'm going to go down with my minus button and then that way I can go to like a 1.2 and there I've got a good paper piecing stitch. And again, it's easy to find your black background to find your default. Here on the end is your tension. Now, this is a button that I tend to just kind of not use very often. Generally four, which is your standard needle tension and thread tension, is going to do everything just fine. This Baby Lock Soprano comes equipped with an automatic fabric sensor system, which is going to sense the weight of your fabric when you put it under the foot pedal. So I don't generally need to make any editing adjustments here, but if you feel like you you need to, you certainly can. You can increase or decrease your tension accordingly. I want to go back to this stitch length right here and talk about this for a second. So Baby Lock has a way where you can have a stitch memory built into your machine. So back in the day before I got these lovely new glasses I have on my face, I used to like sewing at a length of three for my garments because this way I could rip out all of my mistakes more easily because I could actually see them. Now, if I'm going to sew like this 99% of the time that I'm sewing, I'm going to want to save that to memory so that I can have it stitched that way for myself every time that I sew. So right here, this little button right here actually can save that stitch setting into memory so that every time I choose a center needle position out of my keypad way of sewing this particular stitch it's going to pull out that stitch with my settings saved onto it so let me go ahead and save that into the memory see it tells you right there it's saving it so if I was to go do something else and then I come back to this stitch my stitch with my custom setting and I select it, there it pulls it out with my particular setting already in play. Now, what does that mean in terms of turning the machine off and turning the machine back on? So it woke up on the keypad way of setting, stitch number three, and it woke up with and held onto my setting because I had saved that into my machine's memory. Now, if I got glasses, which I now have, and I need to reset that for myself so that I can have it on a normal sewing stitch length, again, I can overwrite or resave in my new setting. So I've hit save and now it's saved it. So again, when I turn the machine off and turn the machine back on because I resaved my setting, there I am on my keypad way of sewing stitches, stitch number three, and I'm back to my default. So this button right here is fantastic. If you have a thing that you do always like this, that's where you can put that right into the memory of your machine so that every time you choose the stitch, it will be set up with your custom settings. Okay, let's take a second to talk about this button here. This is a temporary reset button. So if I had selected the length of three and saved that into my machine, but right now, really quickly, I just wanted to sew a seam at the default without having to struggle to go up or down to find my black background. This button right here is a quick temporary reset to defaults. So by touching that, it brings me right back to my default. Okay, this third icon down where it's got the a little picture of your uh, presser foot, the needle, and then some circle air arrows right here. That is a needle exchange key. So when I select that key, the machine is going to give me a message. It says, do you want to use the presser foot lifter button to lower the presser foot? Yes is of course the answer. This is a needle exchange key because what it's actually going to do is now I touch that button again and it's got this little display on my screen. So if I touch these buttons, nothing is happening. If I touch these buttons, nothing is happening. This is called a needle exchange key because it locks up the machine for me so that I can safely change my needle. And when I'm done changing my needle, I just need to disengage this function by touching the button again. And now I'm back to my regular ready to sew mode. 
Okay, I wanna spend a second working on these guys over here on the far right side of your screen. Let's start with the very first one. So the very first one right here is your operational menu. I remember that because I literally hear in the words in my head, that little dot is $8.95 and the line item is lasagna. So I remember that it's a menu that way. Okay, so if I select this operational menu and I go in here to this part of the machine and I make a change, I can actually save a change into the memory so that the machine is going to operate the way that I tell it to, maybe to customize for the type of project that I'm doing. Something thicker might require more presser foot pressure, something thinner might require less, etc. So once I come in here to this operational menu and I make a change to how the machine is working, the machine is going to work the way that I'm telling it to, which means when I turn it off at night and I'm done with this project and I turn it on again in the morning and I start to do something else, the machine is still doing what I told it to. So if I'm off and on to a new project, I need to go back into my operational settings and make sure I either go back to default or I customize it for the new project that I'm working on. This is a good thing. The machine doesn't assume you're done with that project from the night before. You might actually have to finish it up the next day. So the machine is still gonna hold on to those settings that you told it to so that you have your project perfectly ready to go and perfectly set for the thing that you're working on. Just remember when you're done working on that and you're off to something new, go on back to your default and make your changes back to the default. Okay, so let's talk about this operational menu. All right, so you can see right here at the bottom of the screen that there are nine pages where you can customize this machine to work for you. This is the first three selections that you have in your operational menu. So how do I make a change in here? Well, there are three sets of um, options down here below your screen. If I want to go to page two, I'm going to use this far left-hand side of buttons. To go from a one to a two, I need to add. So I've gone to page two. If I was on one and I wanted to get to page nine, I would go backwards, I would take away, and that takes me down to page nine. Okay, so here we are on page one. The second set of options here, or editing options, is that it actually changes the selection on the page. So I turned on my menu, and the first thing it did was wake up on check my ABCs. If I wanted to change my needle position, I'm gonna need to go down to that option. So this little down-facing triangle gets me down to the second option. If I need needed to go back up, I would go to my upward facing triangle and that gets me back up to check my ABCs. But I wanna go down. Let's go to twin needle mode. So let's just talk about that one for a second. If I wanna make a change to the twin needle mode, if I wanna turn that on, this third set of editing options here is where I'm going to do that. So I'm gonna to toggle to the right and that's going to take it from off to on. If I wanna go off, I can toggle to the right again. You can actually go back to the left as well on this one and it goes on or off. So some of these editing options here in your menu just have an on or an off or a left or a right or simply two ways of working. Some of your other things here in this menu are gonna have more. And this is where we can toggle through those different options for each thing that we're trying to set. So let's go back up to check our ABCs. So I'm gonna use my upward facing triangle to do my check ABCs. So if I had written out a name, for instance, I had a gentleman one time and he wanted to do um, bias binding on 27 quilts he was making for his grandchildren and he wanted the binding to say grandpa's t-shirt quilts. Well, that took a long time to type out. Again, you use your quick reference guide and go into the lid of your machine to spell all that out. When he did that, he wanted to make sure that he spelled out grandpa's t-shirt quilts properly. So if you wanna check your ABCs, that's a lot of words, not all of which are gonna be on the display. So you're gonna to come to the right facing triangle and you're gonna to toggle through so that you can make sure you've spelled grandpa's t-shirt quilts out properly. So that's check your ABCs. 
The second option we have here is your needle position. You can customize your machine to stop with the needle in the down or the up position. So if I toggle down to option number two on page number one, there we are in needle position. And right now my machine is customized to stop in the down position, which is of course what I want. As I go to turn a corner, I want that needle in the down position. So it's kind of holding my fabric in place for me and my fabric doesn't fly off my machine. And now I've lost my perfect spot. So I generally sew with my needle in the down position. The third option we have is twin needle. So I'm going to scroll down to twin needle. Right now and out of the box, your machine defaults with your twin needle in the off mode. However, if you are going to use a twin needle, let's say you're going to use a twin needle to hem a t-shirt or for something decorative, you're going to want to put that twin needle mode on. So again, on the far right, I'm going to toggle to the right and there I have my twin needle mode on. Now what that's going to do is if I choose a stitch up here that's unsafe to choose, the machine's gonna give me an error code saying, whoa, you're in twin needle mode, you can't use that stitch. So the idea behind a twin needle is that there's one shaft that goes up into your machine just like your regular needle. And then below number six, where you put your thread in under the, to get ready under your needle gar guide or needle bar, there's going to be a bracket and off of either side of that bracket are your two twin needles, your left needle and your right needle. So if the needle is going further in the left direction because you've chosen a larger stitch and you don't put it in twin needle mode, your, your needle is offset to the left of where it normally would be. So by selecting twin needle mode, if you try to choose a stitch that's going to put you into an unsafe position, the machine is not gonna let you do that. It'll say, whoa, 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 you can't do that with the twin needle. And that's something that we really like, the machine to help protect us from ourselves. So most of the time when you're not in twin needle, you're going to make sure that you're in twin needle off so that that mode is off. Okay, I want to keep talking about the menu, so I need to go to page two. So again, on the far left hand side of my, underneath my screen, I'm going to add from one to take it to two. So here we have two options here, and the first one is width control. So I'm going to scroll up to width control, and let's just talk about that for a second. So width control is a really, really cool feature that this machine has that actually takes the speed and marries this speed to the width of your stitch or to the placement of the needle. So if I'm in slow, that's actually going to be a straight stitch. If I was over here on fast, that would make me with a super wide zigzag. And there are several different examples of how that's a really cool situation. So let's just talk about that for a second. So I'm going to take my width control and I'm going to turn it into the on mode. And I'm going to say okay to get out of the operational menu. And I'm gonna give you some examples of how I might use the width control. Okay, so this width control feature is a really cool feature, but it has some very different types of applications. So I had a customer one time and she wanted to quilt her quilt with what looked like audio sound waves, loud and soft and loud and soft. And her son's in a heavy metal rock band, so of course that's ideal. And she said, I wish I could. And I said, hey, you can. So we went into the menu and we turned the width control on. And what that does is it, again, it marries the needle to the speed control. So let's just see what this looks like. I have chosen, first of all, a zigzag stitch so that I could get those audio sound waves, which from my keypad way of selection is stitch number five. I'm going to go ahead and turn on my automatic lift and pivot and my automatic reverse and my automatic cutting. So my machine is doing everything for me and I'm going to start sewing. And as I sew, I'm going to toggle this lever to the left and to the right so that you can see what happens. So I, you have to actually have your presser foot plugged in for this. Your foot pedal, I mean, has to be plugged in for this because you're going to be using the speed for width instead of for speed. Okay, so I'm going to start sewing. So right now it's wide, medium, skinny, medium, wide, skinny, wide, medium, medium, wide, skinny, 
All right, let me tap my reverse button so that you can see what that looks like. So again, I can control how wide my zigzag is or how narrow my zigzag is, depending on where I am sliding my speed control. So now I'm done with the width control. It's very important that you turn the width control off when you're done using that function. The reason is because it's going to actually marry that needle to wherever you have it on the sliding speed scale. So if I was trying to do a left needle position and I had left this width control on and the speed over on the far right, it's going to lock the needle in the left position. So I'm saying, why isn't my machine going into the left needle position? Because I I left the width control on, so I have to turn it off. Again, that's a perfect example of why when I'm done doing a particular treatment, I need to go back to my menu and go back to my default when I'm done with the specific thing. So I'm going to take that width control and I need to turn it off and that's with these arrows on the far right underneath my screen. So now I'm toggled into the off function. So whoo, we're done with that. Next we have on page two, initial position. In other words, when you turn your machine on, where do you want your needle to wake up? Do you want it to wake up in the center or in the left? Okay, let's talk about left needle position versus center needle position. So back in the day, we only had straight stitch sewing machines when they were first invented. So you had a needle plate, which had a tiny little hole, and then you had your presser foot, which had a tiny little hole, and your needle was able to go in and out of there, and your fabric was very tightly held and managed so that you could have nice, clean, perfect, beautiful stitches. Now, our needle plates, for the most part, have an opening because we're doing decorative stitching. So our needle is passing left and right within that opening. So some people are used to sewing in the center and that's just where they want to sew and that's okay. But be aware that if you're sewing in the center needle position, your needle is going in and your fabric is actually coming down with it. And then your needle is coming back out and it's pulling your fabric back out with it. So if you get into a position where you're really struggling, say you have a thicker project or something like that, if you move over into the left needle position, three sides of your fabric are now going to be held in place, nice and tight and secure. So sometimes it really is helpful to sew in that left needle position with some of your bulkier projects. So how do you want to wake up? Do you want to wake up in center needle position, which is very popular with quilters, because in order to get a quarter inch, a perfect quarter inch, they sew with the needle in the center and their edge of their fabric is on the right side of the presser foot. So a quilter might wake up with the initial position in center, but if I was a garment sewer or a tote bag sewer or something that I use bulkier projects more often than not, I might toggle over to the left needle position so that that's where my machine woke up and was ready to work for me. Again, it's awesome that I can customize this machine for how I work because it's all about me. All right, let's go to page three. So here on the left hand side, we're going to go up from two to three. The first option we have at the top of the page is elongation. All right, so let's just go over elongation for a second. In order to demonstrate elongation, I'm going to go ahead and select leaf number two, vine number two, and I want to pick stitch number 19. So there we are on this beautiful little scallop stitch. Elongation lets me lengthen and shorten this particular stitch. I love this because I had a customer that did dolly dresses and me dresses. So she needed a shorter, tighter function on the scallop for the dolly dresses. And then for the little girls dresses, she wanted a longer scallop. So elongation lets you do that. So let's just look at that real quick. First of all, here on the right side, I'm going to go ahead and select a single scallop. So this button here, I know I'm jumping ahead, but that's all right. This button here is my single. See, I have a single heart versus continuous. I have a heart and a heart and a heart and a heart and a heart. Up here at the top of the screen in the top right hand corner, right now, that indicates that I have one heart. So I'm in single mode with my single stitch. I'm going to come to the menu and I need to go to page three two, three, elongation, and it default opens on an elongation setting of three. I want to go down to a one. 
So there I am on my elongation of one. I'm gonna come down here and I'm going to select OK. So now that is a much more compact stitch displayed on my screen. I'm going to type in 19 again, and I'm going to go back to my menu, back to page three, to elongation, and make that an elongation of two. So now this second scallop that I have is going to be slightly longer than the first. I'm gonna come down here and select OK. We get to do this five times, by the way, so you won't get lost. Let me type in number 19 again. That's my third scallop. I need to make that an elongation of three. So I'm gonna to come to my menu, and I'm going to go to page three, and now I'm gonna change my elongation from a two to a three. Now that I'm on an elongation of three, I need to select OK to get out of my menu, and I'm going to type in 19 so that I have my fourth scallop. I'm gonna to go to my operational menu, go to page three, take my elongation from a three to a four. I'm gonna say OK to get out of there. Last but not least, I type in my fifth scallop, go to my menu, go to page three, take my elongation from a four to a five and select OK. So I have five of them here, but they're not displayed on my screen. Again, that would be an example of where if I went to my operational menu to page one to check my ABCs, I could scroll through the different stitches to see if I actually did it properly. All right, let's stitch this out and see what it looks like. Okay, so I'm ready to go, and I've got my end foot on this time because the scallop stitch has quite a bit of density, and I wanted to pass underneath that decorative stitch foot without getting smushed. So let's see what that looks like. So once again, we've got an elongation of one, and then slightly longer for two, three, four, and five. That's just about perfect. Our second option on page three of our menu is thread density, and this is really cool. There are some satin stitches built into the vine leaf menu number two, and I've selected number 10. So I'm going to come down to thread density here, and right now it defaults on an open or less dense stitch. Let me say okay. So again, I've got my end foot on the machine and I have my stitch number 10, see vine number two, stitch number 10. And right here, once again, I have a single version. I'm going to type in 10 again. So there's my second scallop stitch so that we can see the difference in the density between the loose and the more dense one. So I need to come to my operational menu and I need to go to page three. I'm going to go down to the second option on the page and I'm going to take it from the default of less dense over to more dense, which is going to compact our stitches. Let me select okay to get out of there and let me show you what that looks like. Okay, so as we look at this, let's just understand why I would choose one stitch versus the other. If I had a lighter weight fabric like the shirt I have on or a lightweight batiste, lightweight fabrics aren't gonna be able to sustain the density of thicker stitches like this. So I'm gonna choose the less dense version for lighter weight fabrics and dense version for denims or canvases or things that can hold and support all that thicker stitching. The last option on page three is character spacing. So if you've gotten something where you've spelled out, again, something like grandpa's t-shirt quilts, and you wanted it to take up more space as you were sewing, you could go into the character spacing and simply add in extra space or take away space. Let's go to page four. So I'm gonna to toggle down here on the left. Now we're on page four and I'm gonna go up to that first option on page four, which is size selection. Some of your stitches have a large and a small option. Now see here it says select a pattern. Because I haven't picked a pattern or a stitch, it's like, what are you doing? There's no large and small, you haven't selected anything. Okay, so I'm gonna get out of there for a second and I'm gonna go ahead and pick a stitch. Let's say I'm gonna choose vine one and I'm gonna select number 34. Now I'm gonna to come to my menu Go to page four, 
There I am on size selection one more time, and when I toggle to the right, you see there I have a small version and a large version. You can make adjustments to how your feed dogs are working, depending on your type of project that you have, um, vertical and horizontal adjustments. But I have to say, I'm not the type of person that noodles around a lot in that kind of thing. My, if my feed dogs aren't working properly or my stitches aren't forming properly, I'm probably going to go to my local dealer, my guys here in Maitland or my technician up in the villages. I'm going to say, hey, here's my machine. It's not stitching properly. You need to make it work. But it does allow you the option, let's say you were doing um, fabric fuse to some sort of in our form and you were having a little trouble with that particular stitch because what you're putting under the presser foot is so thick. You could make adjustments to how those feed dogs are working within the context of that fabric and all that thickness and bulk. It allows you to customize the machine for your particular projects. Me, I'm not doing that. But you, if you feel comfortable, you've been sewing forever in your whole life, then you go for it. <laughs> All right, let's go on and go to page five. Here we are on page five. The very first option on the page is your presser foot pressure. So depending on what you're putting underneath your foot, whether you need to increase your pressure because say you have a chiffon or decrease your pressure because you've got something thicker and you need it to pass under and it's really struggling to get under your machine, you can increase or decrease your presser foot pressure right there on page five of your menu. Your presser foot height. So if I scroll down to presser foot height, you'll notice a difference between my black letters in my white background, my white numbers, and my black background. Numbers, not letters. Anyway, here at presser foot height. Why is that not on my default? Well, it's not on my default because I have my auto lift and pivot selected for myself. So because I have that, this presser foot height has to do with when I lift my presser foot up off of my project that this is going to have that auto lift function. So my presser foot height is almost always at 10 because I love, 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 love this lift and pivot function on this baby lock soprano. So the third option on this page is the automatic fabric sister sensor system. This needs to be on. This is your automatic tension. So again, when I put the foot down, that's going to sense the weight or thickness of the fabric that I have underneath of it and properly deliver the tension for me. I love the fact that this machine does that and I don't have to have a dial that I'm messing with. It allows me the ability to just automatically go through from Skinny fabrics like chiffon to thicker fabrics back to skinny, maybe something medium, skinny. I can do whatever I want and the machine is automatically going to have that fabric sister sensor system engaged. Out of the box, that's not turned on because this machine doesn't know whether you want to work that way or not. Maybe you want to make those adjustments yourself because you really want to have control over exactly every little thing that you're doing. Mm, go ahead, leave it off. Me, I'm turning it on. All right, let's go to page six. Here we are on page six. If you go to do free motion, you have the ability to turn that free motion mode on and that's going to drop your feed dogs for you. So if I scroll up to free motion, I can go from off to on. And that again, that engage, disengages my feed dogs for me, which is a wonderful option. The next option on page six is the free motion foot height. So if I scroll down to there, let's talk about that for a second. So if I put high loft batting or thicker, denser batting underneath, because I'm going to do some free motion quilting on my high loft batting for my friend in Maine or something, this allows me to increase and decrease my foot height to compensate for that thickness as I'm moving it around underneath the foot pedal, the presser foot. And the thing is, remember, you don't want to be smooshing your fabric. If you're free motion quilting, that fabric needs to pass easily underneath that presser foot. So if you need to make adjustments because it's the presser foot is too low and it's smooshing your fabrics, this is where you can go in and do that. So that's where you can make that change or adjustment. Pivoting height. 
Pivoting height, again, has to do with when I lift to turn my fabric because I might be doing applique, I can increase or decrease the amount of lift that happens while I'm turning my fabric. So if I was doing an applique polar fleece heart on a polar fleece piece of fabric, that's a lot of height. I might need to have a little bit extra pivoting height to do that. And this is where you would make that change. All right, let's go to page seven. Page seven has some basic operational stuff. I like to leave my buzzer on so that I can hear it when I'm touching things. I like to leave my light on as well. However, if you were doing tone on tone sewing, you could turn your bed light off, everything that's under here. And that way you could put a lamp across your project and you could see the texture of what you're sewing on a little bit more easily. So 99% of the time you're gonna have your bed light on, but that 1% where you might want it off, this is where you could change that option. Brightness. Brightness does not have to do with the brightness of underneath your sewing area. Brightness here on page seven, this indicates the brightness of the screen. So if you have um, a conditioned macular degeneration or something like that, you need to increase or decrease the brightness of your screen. This allows you to do that. For the most part, the brightness on its own is fine, but at least you can customize it to, for the type of vision issues you might be struggling with. Love that from Babylock. All right, page eight. Page eight has reinforcement priority as the first option. All right, now let me explain this. I adore this feature. Seriously, I'm not a quilter. I have a theater background. I was used to working in costume shops and I never had fancy machines like this in the theater. So one of the things is, is that when I'm going to do a quilt now, I'm not used to using my reinforcement button on my machine. My finger has a habit of years and years and years of touching my reverse button in, instead of touching my reinforcement button or my locking key. So if I take this reinforcement priority and I turn it on, what that does for me is saves me from myself. In other words, if I choose a stitch that is a locking stitch, for instance, remember we talked about one, two, three, and four, that one has a reverse, three has a reverse, two and four are my locking stitches? Okay, so if I was to select my keypad way of sewing, and I wanted to select stitch number two. Oh, look, I'm in free motion mode. Let me go back to my operational menu. Two, three, four, five, six. Free motion, turn that off. Okay, so here I am on my keypad way of selection and I've chosen stitch number two, which is a locking stitch. So if I'm going to go do my piecing and I need that locking stitch, I need to save myself from myself. Because I've chosen a locking stitch, even if I accidentally touch my reverse button at the end, it's gonna do the reinforcing for me because I've set reinforcing as a priority on the stitch that I chose that has a reinforcement option. I love it. It's like, ba 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 ba. I got you. You chose the reinforcement stitch. That's exactly what I'm going to do. It's awesome. So for me, I leave that reinforcement priority on and I leave it on all the time. Whoop. Okay, let's go back to our operational menu. So we're gonna go to page six, seven, eight. <laughs> Reinforcement priority, go ahead and leave that on. It's wonderful and it helps save you from accidentally touching the wrong button if you don't mean to. Input sensitivity, the second option on page eight. I really don't have to mess with this very often. This has to do with if you feel like the screen and the face of the machine aren't responding to your touch, you can increase or decrease the sensitivity on that. But seriously, I haven't had one person in, in a number of years ever have to mess with that. If you are really struggling and it's like, dang, I'm touching this and just nothing's happening, well, then you're welcome to change those settings. But honestly, I haven't had anybody in years ever need to do that. Okay, the third option on this page, when you take your machine out of the box, it's gonna ask you what language you wanna speak. If you have a different language that you're fluent in, please feel free to choose another language. <laughs> I speak English, so I'm gonna select English. Let's go to page nine. 
This last page of your operational menu simply indicates for your technician what version you have on your machine, when it was manufactured and what version you currently have. And that is it for the operational menu. So that finishes up that part of our lesson. This machine has the ability to customize your stitches within a mirror imaging capacity, which is awesome. Yes, there's a million beautiful stitches on this machine, over 300, but you can customize it to be even more than that by mirror imaging and single and continuous. So let's just talk about the mirror imaging editing option. So right here on this second option down on the right side of the screen, you've got mirror imaging. So let's just take a look Look here at um, vine leaf option number one with stitch number 34. It's this beautiful kind of S curve type stitch. It really is a really cute little stitch. So on its own, this particular stitch starts on the right side of the foot, comes around and makes an S and ends on the left side of the foot. So there that stitch is in a continuous version. Now, by using my mirror image and my single and continuous in conjunction with one another, I'm going to select it to one single stitch number 34. Now I'm gonna select, select stitch number 34 again, and on this second one, instead of ending on the left and starting on the right, I'm going to mirror image that so that it starts on the left and ends on the right. It almost makes it look more like a mustache. It's so cute. So let's look at that. So on this one, it ends on the left and starts on the right. That's the normal stitch in its just unique creation from within the machine. But if I wanna customize it, this one ends on the left and starts on the left. This one's gonna end on the right and start on the right because I made it continuous. So it's really got some fun options for you to play with there. Okay, so finally here in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you've got a star and a heart against a needle. This will start stitching your motif at the beginning of that particular motif. So I've stitched out an example to show you. So I've gone along and I've stitched and I just ended, ended right there. So if I want to start at the beginning for row number two, I simply need to select that option and that's going to start at the beginning. There's a beep that sounds, but nothing visually changes on screen. So now as I moved up to row number two, it started at the beginning of the stitch. So here's a close up example of not selecting that button. So I finished motif number one, started into motif number two, and quickly just cut my thread moved my fabric and started sewing again. So this second stitch picked up where the first one left off. So if you want to start fresh at the top of the stitch, that's where you're going to go ahead and select this button right here and it'll just start right at the beginning of the motif. Now, another one here in the bottom right hand corner of the screen is a back pocket, a memory pocket. See how the arrow's pointing down into the pocket? So if I've created this stitch that looks more like a mustache in my twisted little brain, and I love it, and I wanna use it again, I can select this button, and now I've got my five different pages where I can select different memory pockets that I can save a stitch for future use. If I wanna save it into pocket number two, all I need to do now is select okay. It's gonna save it into pocket number two. Okay, so now how do I get it out of the memory? So if today is day two and I need to keep working on that particular stitch pattern for my project, see here how it's got the keypad, which is these 10 common use stitches, and a pocket. It's kind of like the end of a calendar, 30 and 31st. <laughs> so if I wanna select my memory pocket, I need to go from my keypad way of selection, touch the button a second time, and there we are in our memory pocket. Now, I need to get to this second line, the second thing that I stored. So again, this center area is where I'm gonna do my down arrow to get to that particular option, and then I'm gonna select OK to pull it out, and there it is ready for me to work on again. 
I want to spend a few moments talking about some of the optional accessories that are actually not optional for you because Baby Lock included them for you. So first of all, you've got a quilt bar. This quilt bar allows you to do a row of stitches and then move this quilt bar so that that first row of stitches is lined up with this little edge over here. And then you can sew your second row, which would then bump over and line up with this, etc. So you're gonna take your walking foot and you can install that quilt bar into the back of your walking foot. And then it's adjustable depending on where you want it to be, where you want your stitches to form. This quilt bar also installs at the back of your presser foot in your presser foot holder area. One of the optional feet that comes with your machine that's actually included for you is the quarter inch foot with a guide. This is wonderful for when you're doing your piecing that you can line the edge of your fabric up with that flange that hangs off on the right side of the foot and then you can sew your perfect quarter of an inch. Along the lines of your quilt bar, this particular foot is a stitch guide foot. So all those little notches are made so that you can line up a row of stitches with them so that when you sew the next row of stitches and then the third row of stitches, that they're all being evenly spaced depending on which particular notch or mark you've chosen. This guy is a open toe foot and a candle wicking foot both. It's wonderful in terms of the fact that if you choose a candle wicking stitch like this one, which is found in vine one, stitch number 20, on the back of the foot, there's a deeper groove cut out of the back of the foot than is on the end foot. So this really allows for those large, very densely compacted stitches, especially towards the center of those candle wicks. It allows them to pass through without being hindered. Finally, you've got a Teflon foot. For anybody that's ever sewn cork or vinyl, you'll find this foot to be invaluable. It really allows those um, stickier feet or stickier fabrics that are harder to manipulate, it allows them to pass under this foot without getting caught up on the metal. This is our J foot as indicated by the letter behind the snap-on bar. So the J foot is our standard utility zigzag presser foot. This foot is really good because you've got a clear view here and you've got three notches to indicate left needle, center needle, and right needle positions. This is our end foot or our decorative stitch foot and sometimes it's referred to as the monogramming foot. On this particular foot, there is no metal across the center of the presser foot. It allows you a nice clear view into what you are stitching. Now the big difference between the end foot and the J foot happens on the back of the feet. Let's look at that. So here we have side by side our J foot, our utility zigzag foot, and our decorative stitch foot. So the differences between the feet are actually quite obvious. Even though the opening where the needle will do its stitches is exactly the same size opening, the J foot is longer, helping the fabric to grab faster under the feed dogs. But the end foot is wider. This allows the fabric to have more of it held into position while the decorative stitches are forming. The real difference though is on the back of the feet. When I turn the feet upside down, you can see the end foot actually has a channel that goes from the front to the back, which allows the buildup of denser satinish type of stitches to slide through without getting stopped by being pushed on at the foot and uh, feed dog area as it would have done on the J foot. This is the G foot. The G foot is there for overcasting. Overcasting is a stitch that will seal the edges if you've got fabrics that fray. If you look at the G foot, along the length of the foot, there's kind of a right side and a left side to this foot. Along the right side of the foot, there's a flange that comes around that will balance your fabric or brace your fabric. Let me turn that foot over for a second and let's look at the back of it. There's actually a tiny little piece of metal on that flange that hangs down beneath the foot where you can brace your fabric right up against the edge of that flange. So let's see what that looks like. 
When I place my fabric underneath the G foot, the overcasting foot, that fabric can actually push against that little flange that hangs beneath the foot. So when you're putting your fabric there, you're gonna butt right up against that little flange and place your foot down. So here with this overcasting stitch, the thread forms over the edge of your fabric and that way it helps contain or encase the edge of your fabric so that the fraying will not happen. So this is our R foot for blind hemming. You'll notice on this foot there is a very large metal flange which we're going to brace our fold of our fabric up against in order to create that blind hem. Let's look at how that works. With a blind hem stitch, the bulk of the stitches forms on the right side of this fold. So you're going along and it stitches along here, leaps over and takes just a teeny tiny little nip of the folded fabric, comes back over to this side, sews along, leaps over and takes a nip, comes back over and sews along. So the important thing is to put that fold of your fabric right up against that metal flange and to sew slow enough so that when you're watching it here that you watch the needle take a nip of the fold. Also, you're going to be making that letter Z in order to create that blind hem there. So it comes over and forms the letter Z. So that's how we're gonna do the blind hem. Let's see what it looks like. Leap, watch it, nip, back over, nip. So you wanna just grab one or two threads. You don't wanna have railroad ties on the other side of your fabric. And obviously you would match your thread color. So this is the inside of your fabric where the outside is my little nips. So to create that blind hem, you're folding up the bottom of your fabric, the hem of your fabric, because you wouldn't want to have raw edges showing. Then your fabric gets folded on top of that so that the fold and the edge of the fabric has about a quarter of an inch that creates the letter Z, and that's how we do a blind hem. The I foot is your zipper foot, and depending on whether you're feeding in the left side of your zipper tape or the right side of your zipper tape, you're gonna snap your foot on either side accordingly. This is the A foot or the buttonhole foot. Your machine will form a perfect size hole because you can slide open the end of the buttonhole foot, place your button in the end and pinch it down. Right here between these two flanges, there's a buttonhole lever which will pull down and it will sew the perfect size hole for the button because the diameter is measured here at the end of the A foot. Let's see how that works. To install the A foot, this portion of the foot is quite high. So if you lift up, it'll give it some extra height in order to clap down on that bar. Then you need to pull down your buttonhole lever. So that lever needs to go down in between the two arms of the foot so that it will trigger as it hits the back and hits the front to tell the machine, I need to sew back, wait, I need to go to the front, wait, now I need to go to the back. So you get that perfect buttonhole. So you'll mark the placement of your buttonholes on your fabric. When you go to slide the fabric now under the presser foot, you'll see that mark inside the opening on your presser foot. 
When you put your foot down, I like to have the fold of my fabric along the right side of my foot, and I like to be able to see inside that opening my line of where I've indicated my buttonhole needs to start. I also like to have that line just in front of the red marks on the inside of my foot. Also, to know where the center of your buttonhole is, where you're going to be slitting open your buttonhole, there's a center red mark on your presser foot as well. When removing your buttonhole foot, you're going to drop your foot down just like you've done all of the other presser feet. However, at this point, you need to remember that the buttonhole lever needs to be slid back up inside the machine, all the way at the highest position. This is the M foot. This is the foot you use to install a button. So with this particular foot, there is a clear plastic lever here, which actually creates a shank space. When that lever is pushed down, there is a clear plastic flange right in the opening of the foot, which allows the thread to form over that flange, giving you a little bit of distance so your button isn't sewn directly to your fabric. It'll give you a little bit of area and space to create a shank. So when you use this foot, you need to start by installing the button into the foot. So with this particular foot, there's a little bit of a spatula there, and the button is gonna go between the white plastic and the spatula. You'll be placing the holes of the button next to the red indication marks on your presser foot, and it is held in place between this metal spatula and the white plastic part of the top of the foot. When installing your M foot, just as with the A foot, you're gonna need to lift in order to install over the height of the presser foot and bring your presser foot down to clamp right into position. Be sure and mark your fabric as to where your button will be installed. When you go to select the button fixing stitch, you need to make sure, because not all buttons are created equal, that your needle is going to insert itself in either side of the hole of each hole on your button. So you're gonna slowly turn your hand wheel down to make sure that your needle has full clearance on one side, keep turning towards you, and then check the other side. Now, right now, my needle has hit the button because I don't have the button in the right position. So at that point, you just need to gently noodle your button into a slightly different position so that the needle will have its clearance. I like to check it twice. I'm clear on the right. I'm clear on the left. And also see right there that the stitches are forming over that shank flange to give your button a little extra space. I like to stitch this nice and slow and let the machine form its stitches. Sometimes, just because I have a theater background, I like to do that twice just to make sure that button will not go anywhere. When you remove your button out of this foot, you're gonna to need to lift your presser foot and pull the button straight towards you. And as you can see, there's a little bit of space formed underneath that button so it's not formed so tight up against your fabric. And there you've installed your button. I'd like to show you how to install the walking foot. You're gonna start by removing whatever foot you have on the machine. Once you've dropped that off, now you need to remove the presser foot holder or ankle. So if you have your disc shaped screwdriver, you're gonna start by righty tighty, lefty loosey, loosening the bolt on your 
presser foot holder so that it falls off. Once your presser foot holder is removed, your walking foot is going to slide right around that bolt, but you have to do two things at once. You're also going to need to install the claw of your walking foot up over your needle bar. So the claws around the needle bar, I'm going to loosen this bolt just a little bit. Once you've got the claw around the needle bar, you're going to bring that walking foot forward right through the bolt, and then you're going to tighten the bolt to hold the walking foot foot directly to the shaft of the machine. Your walking foot is going to help you manage multiple layers of fabric. Well, that brings us to the end of our lesson today. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you're super excited to get started with your brand new machine. Once again, we have this machine available if you haven't actually purchased it yet in two locations, both here at the Sewing Studio Fabric Superstore in Maitland, Florida, as well as up at our location in Lady Lake, the Sewing Studio at Lady Lake. And we also have them on our website, www.sewing.net. Please come in and visit us. We'd love to have you. Thanks so much. And let's Let's get your sewing journey started.